welcome back. Um, I hope that your lunch and discussion was uh, productive, interesting, enjoyable. Um, we had some fantastic presentations. I learned a lot personally um, in the, this morning um, between our keynote and Regina Bartley, and of course our broad range of talks from our lightning, uh, our lightning uh, talk winners. Um, it's kicking off this, uh, this afternoon's agenda. We have Pat Walters. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Pat when I was at Zebi AI. Um, he uh, is well known for his uh, practical cheminformatics blog and just got an award, I think I saw, for um, his contributions to cheminformatics. Um, Pat was global head of modeling informatics at Vertex for more than 20 years. Currently, he's chief data officer at Relay Therapeutics, where he leads the development and application of computational components of Relay's drug discovery platform. Pat is co-author of the book, Deep Learning for the Life Sciences. And the title of his talk is, Where the Rubber Hits the Road, Applying Machine Learning on Drug Discovery Projects. So Pat, with that, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to the organizers. For those of you who saw my talk on Friday, this is different. <laughs> but there will be a lot of themes here. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start out with this. Like, I absolutely despise the whole idea of AI first drug discovery and computation first drug discovery. In my mind, drug discovery is a team sport. And we're not going to solve drug discovery with AI alone. I think that there are some places that machine learning can help, definitely. And in the course of this talk, I'm going to hopefully highlight a couple of, I think, unusual applications of machine learning and drug discovery, at least different than what I see a lot of people talk about. And then I'll finish up by, with a little rant on generative models and hopefully convince you that no, 100% of the molecules that come out of your generative model are not valid. Not even close. <laughs> All right, so in my world, machine learning spans the entirety of the drug discovery process. So we're using it from the beginning all the way through the end. So in early drug discovery, we may want to get an idea of whether a target is amenable to some of our structure-based approaches. So we're using tools like insert name of fold because there's a new one that comes out every week now. Um, we're using protein structure prediction to aid in the solution of structures. I think it's great that tools like Phoenix now will let you just put in a sequence. It'll automatically generate an alpha fold structure under the hood and then start using that alpha fold structure to do structure refinement. Um, I think, you know, I'll show you what I think is a really cool example of ways of integrating machine learning and quantum chemistry to answer important questions in drug discovery. I'll talk a little bit about machine learning and Dell libraries. Sorry, I talked about active learning on Friday. I'm not going to talk about it again because I don't want to repeat myself. And then I'll talk a little bit about some ways that we're integrating machine learning and molecular dynamics as a tool to optimize the selectivity of a set of molecules. But I want to start out with this, and I didn't even plan to talk about this. But this paper came out a week ago, and I think it's incredibly cool, and I want you to all know about it, too. So Alexander Isayev and Adrian Reutberg, who really were the fundamental drivers behind using machine learning to learn quantum chemical potentials, put out this package called Auto3D. And it's incredibly cool. So it allows me to answer a lot of important question. So what Auto3D does is you can just input a smile string. It will generate a set of conformers, rank the energetics of those using high-level DFT, but you can also get out tautomer and stereoisomer distributions. So on 
Friday, I talked a little bit about some of the ways that we've been using active learning to address very large data sets like enamine real that are now 40 billion molecules. One of the things we found is when you start going big like this and looking at these big data sets, it really tends to amplify any weak points in your workflow. So you know, being a chemist, my group will run a large virtual screen and I say, great, let me look at the top 100 molecules. So this was one of the cases that we ran into where I, we did that and then you know, it turned out that we had a whole bunch of molecules that were that tautomer in the upper left hand corner, which was making a set of beautiful hydrogen bonds. But I looked at that as a chemist and I said, well, that looks kind of non-physical to me. So I don't think it's realistic. So at that point, what I would typically do is go off and do a set of quantum chemical calculations. And sure enough, if I do this, and to be honest, that's kind of a crappy functional, but even with that quantum chemical calculation, it took me five hours to do that calculation. After five hours, it said, that the tautomer that I thought was the predominant one, which is the one down here, <coughs> in fact, was the predominant tautomer. But again, that's five hours to do a calculation on this little tiny fragment of a molecule. So I'm not gonna do that with a lot. The cool thing is with Auto3D, I was able to do the same calculation in 17 seconds. So then it gets to the point where it's not like I just can look at one or two. I can say, great, give me the top thousand molecules and I can run quantum calculations on all of them. So to me, just wanted to throw this out because it's really transformational. I think you should check it out. It's all open source. All right, anyway, so I want to tell you two stories before I start ragging on generative models. So let's, to start out, I want to talk a little bit about one of the areas that we've found incredibly powerful. And actually, you know, I should give credit because Eric Siegel, one of the, inter the organizers of this meeting, and Steve Kearns, who was here, really did a lot of the fundamental work on this. This was work that was originally done at XChem. XChem spun that out into Zebi AI. Relay Therapeutics bought it. It's all in my life now, so. Very happy about that. Um, so let's talk about this. DNA encoded libraries are an incredibly powerful technique. It lets you screen billions of molecules very quickly. You, know, you can have a set of a billion molecules. Each of those has a DNA tag. You figure out which ones bind to your protein. You decode the DNA. You get back to the molecules. So if we think about the way that this works, you typically have a set of chemical building blocks. Each of those building blocks has an associated DNA tag. We can then do a set of reactions. So you can see that now what I've done is I've combined two different building blocks into a two cycle library. So now if I had 10 building blocks of each type, I could put them together. I've got 100 products. So you can imagine how we can continue to build this out now into multiple cycles. We build up our library. Each library member has a DNA barcode attached to it. We can then take our library, incubate it with the protein. So we're gonna begin with our library in solution. We're going to add our protein then there are a variety of techniques we can do to then extract the protein. So we've got the protein now with the molecules attached. Each of those molecules has a DNA barcode. We can then do things, something like heat it. There's a number of ways that we then separate the small molecules from the protein. We can then amplify and sequence the DNA once we've sequenced that DNA, we can then associate those DNA barcodes back to a set of small molecules. Now that sounds really good, but there's a couple of hitches. First of all, in a lot of cases, probably you know, based on historical literature precedent, half of those molecules are not going to confirm. They're just things that have glommed onto 
your protein, and they don't have <coughs> any real binding affinity. The other downside to this is that it tends to be expensive. So you have to t decode those, the DNA barcode, figure out which molecule that DNA barcode corresponds to, resynthesize that molecule, and test it. So that's a relatively, I mean, this is somewhat straightforward chemistry, but it's still going to be time consuming. If you're getting a CRO to do this synthesis for you, you're probably looking at spending a couple thousand dollars per molecule. So in many cases, you're not gonna have a whole lot of shots on goal. But, you know, since this is a conference where we're talking about machine learning, it's probably obvious where we're going from here. So we can take this data, we can then use the molecules that bind as well as the molecules that don't bind. We can use that to train a machine learning model and then we can use that machine learning model to screen these large databases of molecules that are available for synthesis on demand. I have to say that as a computational chemist, probably the most significant thing that's happened to my work over the last five to 10 years has been the advent of libraries like Enamine Real for synthesis on demand. So now, rather than having to you know, choose, typically when we bought commercially available molecules, we had these small libraries of a couple, small, of a couple million molecules that we had to choose from. With these, we have these collections now of, of billions and some vendors are even claiming trillions of molecules available. But we've had great experience, most of my experience has been with the Enamine Real collection. So these molecules, I think there's 40 billion that they have listed right now for synthesis on demand. You select those molecules, you pay about $100 a piece for them, and you typically have them in somewhere between four and six weeks. And in our experience, the success rate for the synthesis has been greater than 80%. So by employing this sort of method, use, run my DNA encoded library screen, use that to then build a machine learning model, use that machine learning model to screen these large synthesis on demand libraries, provides me with a very nice way of finding starting points for <coughs> our drug discovery program. So this is the paper, if you haven't read it, I would Get this, tack it up on your refrigerator. One of my, one of my favorite papers. Uh, so this was in JMED Chem. And as I mentioned, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start out with our Dell data. So we're gonna have the molecules from our Dell library. We'll have those labeled as binders and not binders. We'll then use that information to associate the molecules with some set of chemical descriptors. Use that set of descriptors then to train a machine learning model. Then down below, we'll have the molecules from our synthesis on demand library. So from enamine, Otava, e-molecules. I know there are people here from Wuxi. Shout out to Wuxi. Uh, so, you know, we'll then take those molecules from our synthesis on demand library, we'll make predictions, we'll get the molecules that are predicted to be binders, have those synthesized, bring them in-house and test them. And again, this is a figure from that JMED Chem paper, but it's really impressive. So you can see this, the, the black lines on the left, so focus your attention on the plots on the left-hand side, you can see that black line is at one micromolar. So you can see that you know <clears throat> the first test, soluble epoxide hydrolase, perhaps an easy target, but still, you know, 30% of the molecules, when they built a graph convolutional neural network, 30% of the molecules that were selected in a prospective test. 
know, this was not retrospective screening. We're active, you can see that for estrogen receptor alpha, hit rate slightly less, but still quite reasonable and probably better than most of us are getting from our virtual screens. And then slightly less, but still good hit rate uh, for the kinase C kit. So yeah, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of places that DNA encoded libraries and machine learning fit well together. You have a very large data set. You often have billions of molecules. There are places where it's perhaps not so great, and these are things that people in the field, including us, are continuing to work on. And you've got very imbalanced data sets, but we have techniques for dealing with that. We have relatively noisy data, so I think there are still some challenges here, but there's still a lot that we can do. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, machine learning and molecular dynamics, because I think this is another relatively unusual application of machine learning, but hopefully I'll show you <coughs> some interesting use cases. So one interesting use case for us, and I think for a lot of people in the field, is being able to model and predict selectivity. So in many cases, We'll be working on a drug discovery program. We have a target that we want to hit, but there's a closely related target that we don't want to hit. So what we want to do is design a molecule that will hit our target, but not bind to a closely related anti-target. Because you know, if we bind to the target of interest, Bruce Banner, we will get our therapeutic effect. If we bind to the Incredible Hulk, we end up with side effects. So how can we do that? Yeah, Tudor. Are you predicting the side effects of gamma rays? Thank you, Tudor. <laughs> I always can count on you for a great question. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, but you know, one of the things that we've been able to take advantage of in our drug discovery programs is protein dynamics and the differences in dynamics between targets. So in this particular case, and please pardon the lightning coming out of the protein, <laughs> I, I did not make this graphic. Uh, but the, the point here being is on the left we have FGFR1, which is a target that's essential for phosphate homeostasis. We do not want to inhibit FGFR1. We do, however, want to inhibit FGFR2, which is a target that's responsible for tumor growth. So we want to hit our target. We don't want to hit our anti-target. So how can we really address the protein dynamics, and how can we use this protein dynamics as a key component of our design philosophy. So one of the techniques that we tend to use quite frequently at Relay Therapeutics is a technique called molecular dynamics. So in molecular dynamics, we're using Newton's equations of motion to model the motions of a protein, an associated small molecule, and solvent. And what we'd like to do is find cases where the motion of our molecule with our target is different than it is with our anti-target. One of the things that I like about re being at Relay Therapeutics is it gives us, through our collaboration with DE Shaw Research, access to their Anton supercomputers. So if we think about the way that MD typically works, if you take the NVIDIA V100, which is the state of the art in GPUs. So for a 100,000 system with a V100, I can simulate about a microsecond in a day. With the Anton supercomputer, which is specifically designed for performing molecular dynamics simulations on the same system, we can do about 150 microseconds a day. So this really starts to allow us to address protein motion on a much more reasonable time scale and on a biologically interesting time scale. 
So now we have this capability to do a lot of molecular dynamics simulations. So let's think about the paradigm for molecular dynamics. What do we typically do? We run a simulation, we stare at the, we make a movie of that simulation, we stare at that movie, and we hope that something interesting happens. Right, which is great if you have one or two simulations. If you have a thousand simulations, to be perfectly honest, and I'm gonna hit that mic one more time. Uh, you know, I don't have the patience to look through a thousand simulations. So what can we do? So let's just, let's operate on the assumption that there is a difference in motion between our selective molecules and our unselective molecules. What can we do to capture that? Well, what we typically do is we start out by doing something like I showed you on the previous slide. You say, okay, well, for the selective molecules, the phenylalanine is in, and for the unselective molecules, the phenylalanine is out. So I build a model on that, and you can see I get kind of lousy statistics. So it's not great. So what do you do then? You stare some more, and you're like, oh, there's this hydrogen bond that I think is important too. Let me add that. You know, and I can do this all day, and I can get to, you know, maybe a little bit better model. What Nick Pabone, one of the members of our group, said was, well, why are we being biased about this? Why are we staring at these simulations and deciding what's interesting? Could we approach this in a much more unbiased fashion? So what we want to do here is we want to capture the interactions between the protein and the small molecule over the course of the simulation, and then we want to use those interactions as input into a machine learning model. You know, this is one of the things that I harp on with people. It's really only three things you need to worry about when you're do building a machine learning model. The first is your data. So in this case, our data, our x variable is a molecular dynamics trajectory. Our y variable is the selectivity of the molecules. Representation, incredibly important. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the trajectory as our representation. And then we'll have our machine learning algorithm that comes up with the relationship between x and y. So how does this really work? So here's a molecular dynamics simulation over on the left. And you can see that over the course of the simulation, we're keeping track of all of the interactions between the small molecule and the protein. Over on the white, we're looking at how much that molecule moved over the course of the simulation. So I can essentially associate that behavior with a label as, as, as the selectivity. You know, I can do the same thing with non-selective molecules, and I can, again, run my simulation, capture this set of interactions, and then the deviation of the small molecule over the course of the simulation. I do that over lots of molecules, so I get these signatures that represent the interaction between the protein and the small molecule. Over time, I relate those to my y value, which is my selectivity, and then I use that unbiased model. And you can see that we went from something you know, based on observation that really didn't give us much of a correlation over to a model which we can use to drive chemistry. And this is the sort of thing that we've been able to do repeatedly now. So I think there's a great combination there. All right, now this is the, this is the part of the talk where I start to rant. So if you want to get up and not hear me just express opinions, I won't be offended. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of ill-defined terms in our field. You know, I see this all the time. AI designed drug, AI inspired drug. What, what exactly does that mean? I don't know. And my colleagues, uh, Steve, who's here right now, and my other colleagues, <coughs> 
And I got really annoyed with this and decided that we would try to establish a framework for automated chemical design. We published this earlier this year in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry because I really wanted to put this in front of medicinal chemists who are hearing all of this talk. Uh, let me just skip that. Let's just get into it. So Patrick Riley in our group kind of came up with the initial idea for this. And a lot of it was driven by work on self-driving cars. So if you think about driving a car, you know, we can have level zero, where I have both my hands on the steering wheel and I'm driving. Then maybe at level one, I have a Tesla. And I can take my hands off the steering wheel, but I better be ready to grab that steering wheel if somebody walks out in front of me. And then maybe, you know, a couple levels beyond that, I can go in the back seat and take a nap while the car drives itself. So we tried to come up with something not exactly analogous, but somewhat close to that for automated chemical design. So the way that we looked at this was on two axes. First of all, who comes up with the ideas? So is this a chemist coming up with the ideas and then a machine evaluating those ideas? Is it a machine coming up with the ideas and then a chemist evaluating it? So, you know, some of you may remember this infamous drug discovered in 40 days paper from 2019, right? Yes, they had a generative algorithm that came up with the molecules and then, you know, a group of chemists looked through those molecules and decided what to make. So I don't know that that's automated chemical design and I'll, I'll have a bit more of a bone to pick with that paper in a couple more slides. So remember, two axes. First, who comes up with the ideas? Second, who decides what gets made? So, you know, I think the large part of our industry is still at ACD level zero. Chemists are coming up with ideas. Chemists are deciding what gets made. You know, there has been some work with generative models, but I think a lot of it still you've got chemists deciding. You know, there, there is a portion of our work, I think, that exists at ACD level two. So at level two, chemist is coming up with the idea and then we're using a machine to evaluate those ideas. So if we think about things like, um, if we, I, I saw Adrian Roigberg apparently just heard that I talked about his paper. It was on Twitter, it just popped up on my watch. This is the world that we live in. Uh, it's so cool. Uh, but anyway, back to ACD level two, you know, Chemist comes up with a bunch of ideas, we dock those, we run FEP on them. So maybe that's level two. But I think the other axis that we need to look at this on is how many iterations were there? You know, we see a lot of papers where people did one iteration. That's not drug discovery. So I think as we get to these lower levels, we want to see multiple iterations. I think the other thing that has to be considered here, and I'll get to this in a minute, is whether these molecules can be synthesized, or in some cases, whether these molecules exist at all. So you know, I think the vast majority of what's out there in the literature, the vast majority of what you see in people's pitch decks are still in the first two levels. All right, let me just pick on some people now. So there was this paper that came out earlier this year in molecules where a group had used a generative model to design inhibitors of the SARS-CoV-2 protease. It was like the bandwagon that everybody was jumping on, right? So I always liked these sorts of papers. They, did, they actually didn't synthesize anything. Um, but I always liked these sorts of papers. So, you know, I always look at molecules. I'm a chemist. And I started looking at these and I was like, none of those molecules can exist. You know, these ring systems are completely unprecedented. Nobody has ever made any of those. So, you know, if you take a look at the way that people tend to assess their generative model output, there are three criteria. The first is functional group filters. Okay, I came up with a lot of these functional group filters 25 years ago. They don't work for this because functional group filters are 
based on real molecules that exist. They don't catch stuff like this. Then the other way that people do this is either the QED score that Andrew Hopkins came up with or Angusar Schufenauer's synthesizability. Both of those essentially look at the, the preponderance of fingerprint bits. So they're chopping molecules down into little pieces and saying, do those little pieces exist? I came up with another method, and I'm going to put out a blog post as soon as I have a minute to do this. But I came up with something that I think is much simpler, which is I went through the Kemble database, I extracted all the ring systems and their frequency. If something has never appeared in, in Kemble, it's either really, really difficult to make or nobody thought of it. And I think it's probably more of the former. So, you know, here's an example. If I take a look at this, right, this pyridine, lots and lots of instances of pyridine. Pyridone, lots and lots of instances of pyridone. Ring system in the middle, looks like a Diels Alder addict to me, doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, I, I developed this method. It creates a dictionary of Kemble ring systems does a quick lookup, so it's incredibly fast. Um, so, you know, the authors of this paper, not knowing that I was going to pick on them, uh, very kindly uploaded all of their molecules along with it. So there were, you know, 144,000 molecules in that set. There were 23 of those that the RD kit couldn't violate, couldn't process. They violated rules of valence which is really where most people cut it off for my molecules are valid. But, you know, if you take a look, 74% of those molecules had no precedent, those ring systems had no precedent whatsoever, and, you know, 79% of them contained ring systems that occurred fewer than 10 times. Tudor will tell you that those were probably input mistakes. Um, Oh, okay. I'll just talk about this one for a second. I think this is another thing. I've probably beaten this into the ground, but I think the other thing we really have to consider is the novelty of molecules produced by these generative methods. There was a paper published in 2019 that showed the compound in the middle as a target, that, as an inhibitor of a target that had been published for fibrosis, the authors didn't point out that the molecules on the left and the right had already been published. So I think, you know, not only do we have to assess the validity of these molecules, we also need to look at the precedent. So, you know, this was, I think, the final figure in our paper, but when you start thinking about automated molecular design, I think you really need to start thinking about things like novelty or, you know, how big is the chemical space? You know, I've seen so many slide decks from people working on generative models where they put up this 10 to the 60 number. You know, we're searching 10 to the 60 molecules. No, you're not. You're not even close. So, and then finally, you know, did the machine out, did, the machine outperform a simpler approach. You know, if we would have just done a simple enumeration, would we have gotten to a similar answer? So hopefully I've said so way many, too many times, um, but I've shown you that there are a wide array of ways that you can apply machine learning on drug discovery projects. I'm super excited because there's new things coming out all the time. I am incredibly excited about the fact that it's now become common to publish source code with your papers. I mean, one of the things that I said and something I wrote a few years ago is, I hope we get to the point where not publishing code with your paper is equivalent to smoking in public. So, you know, I, I really think, you know, when you see a paper that, that where there's not code, call people out. I think it's important. Um, Finally, you know, I want to just conclude with the fact that, again, machine learning and drug discovery is incredibly powerful, but it's like one piece of the puzzle. And I don't think that we're going to solve everything with machine learning, but I think we can provide 
some insights and some really important and interesting ways to look at data. I want to thank all my colleagues at Relay Therapeutics who've been involved in some of the things that I talk about. We have a great collaboration with folks at DE Shaw Research who did a lot of the simulations here and were also involved in the machine learning work. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Thanks, Pat. That was uh, great um, to hear. And if we have any questions, please feel free to come up to oh, the Prince of Darkness. Tut yes. Tutor. <laughs> I, I feel obligated to ask a question since I interrupted in a rather impolite manner about the Hulk. Uh, <laughs> you and I go way back, so it's no. On the DEL work, uh, what I wish I could have seen in that paper is a little bit more validation on dark targets rather than like estrogen receptor alpha, anything with the phenol would probably hit. So if you find phenols, you'll find hits. So can you, you don't have to disclose targets, but how is your success story in that area? I, I think our success is similar. So you know, there are okay. targets, there are targets where so we haven't works. done as well. There are targets where we've done incredibly well. And hopefully, you know, very soon I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. And I'm really intrigued about the selectivity work. Does your selectivity work take into account multiple targets? So when you look at selectivity, you actually do molecular dynamics on, uh, like you say, tenfold selectivity. Do you actually run at least two targets to do that tenfold uh, computationally, or is it just the target of interest? No, it's, it's, it's multiple simulations. And actually, the one thing I didn't point out is, in order to get good statistics on this, you really have to do four or five microseconds in triplicate. So it's pretty serious simulation effort to get there. Thank you. Samaya, is there any online uh, or one gone? Yeah, there is a one question online. Um, so I think it's also related to Dell. Um, are you training only with compounds that are confirmed binders or with the full unconfirmed hit set? If the former, then you still incur the synthesis cost before you can take advantage of the ML model. No, we are we are training a model on the full data set before you do the off-DNA synthesis. Cool, thanks. Go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, wonderful talk, it was really interesting. Uh, I was wondering, like one of the claims you make is that uh, generative models are not as useful as we want them to be because they often like give us um, molecules that are just unrealistic or not, not, not possible to synthesize, right? Um, I was wondering, do you see this as a fundamental problem of generative models, or just are we not there yet? So what I mean with that, like, uh, you know, if you look back, like, if we just look at the deep learning of computer vision community, eight years ago, if you looked at, like, the first images coming out of um, generative models of images, they were, were also unrealistic. So you, you could just look at them and see, okay, you know, that's obviously, it's, it looks good, but it's not real. So, uh, and now we're at a point where we have we're much, 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 much better. Um, and I was just wondering, do you see this as similar for the, the generative chemistry? Like, are we just not there yet? Uh, like, with more data, better models, we will get there finally that we will have, like, um, realistic molecules? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Or do you think and and I, I, you know, I don't want to completely dismiss generative models. I think that there's a lot of potential there, and there's a lot that we can build on. But I just don't think we're there yet. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, I, one, one question I was also having is that um, from a you can't really evaluate a generative model as easily as you can, like you can't just say there's a certain accuracy to it, right? Right. So do you see that as also as a problem? Because like in images, the way people evaluate it, it's just to just look at it and say like, this looks good. Right. <laughs> so but it's very subjective, right? So like how, how, how does that work like for, for generative chemistry? Like do you think that would help if we had a better evaluation Yeah, system? I think if, and you know, I know Andrew Hopkins in his talk talked about really trying to integrate medicinal chemistry know-how into this. And I think that's the next step. You know, the, the part of this that I find a little annoying is that I see too many people declaring success already and saying, great, you know, 100% of my molecules don't violate rules of valence. That's still not useful when I look at the fact that 75% of the molecules could never exist. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Wang Gong, are there any other online? OK, go ahead, Latian. Um, Nice talk. I just want to um, ask for your opinion on the Dell machine learning. And also, I was wondering if your selectivity question can also be answered by a bunch of Dell 
uh, data, you know, you know, a, you know, in arrays, right? Maybe it's too early for that. I just wanted to see. Uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot of interesting questions that we can we can answer with Dell, and I think you know one of the things that we've been doing, and I think other people in the field have been doing, is how do we you know how do we look across multiple Dell data sets and then learn from those, learn what we need to avoid, and then I think the other challenge there with Dell is how do we then take these models that we're building to do hit identification and move them into something we can use for optimization. So. Right. Lots of, lots, lots of fun stuff to do still. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more. One, oh, is there one another online? Yeah, yeah. So that's a fun question. So related to publishing papers, if it is work done within a company that do not want to disclose their work fully uh, or release their source code, how would you recommend such companies publish their work? I, if, if you're not going to publish your, if you're not going to release any data, you're not going to release code, then you better write a really, really good method section, <laughs> which you know most people don't. So, I mean, I, I, I think the whole idea of I'm going to keep this method proprietary to my company is just silly. I mean, if we take a look at protein structure prediction, right? All boats rise with the tide. Everybody's learning from everybody else. So, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I have no patience with that. Sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't figure out a way to say that without profanity, so. <laughs> One last question. Hi, Pat, nice talk as nice always. Um, so you showed the Nature Biotechnology paper where like it um, lacks novelty, the AI generated mo molecules, and the molecules paper where like okay, the molecules may be novel, but like not synthesizable or not valid ones. So for generative chemistry, in your opinion, what are the areas where we can improve, uh, we should work on, and like uh, that has like much more value, and like that also strike like uh, the balance between novelty and also uh, the ease of uh, gen uh, uh, yeah, molecules I, useful. I mean, to me, it's it's really getting that medchem intuition in there, and and really being able to capture things, and maybe you know with some of these faster quantum techniques. You could imagine also using that as a way of doing things like evaluating stability. Thank you. Right, thank I you. still think it's so funny that Adrian Roigberg was tweeting while I was talking. He <laughs> tweeted first, then Roigberg. Yeah. Oh, okay. He was asking whether it was. Oh, it was Sumon first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He was asking whether it was good or bad. <laughs> and, and what did you say? I said good. Okay. All right, great. Let's thank Pat. Uh, well, thank you so much.